So it was very interesting this year. I'm, uh, power integrity is something I'm getting a lot more involved with, uh, working with Steve Sandler of PicoTest. And it was exciting this year. We did a paper, co-authored a paper with Xilinx, and they have their 32 gigabit ultra scale FPGA. And of course, you know, you worry about those really high speed, high frequency transients causing a lot of um, simultaneous switching noise, mission mode noise. It turns out, when we uh, actually got into this project and started investigating things, uh, the package and the die have a lot of decoupling that handles the high frequency switching, the, the 32 gigabit. What was more of a challenge was the in-between, where the voltage regulator module doesn't cover, uh, is, is the control loop is no longer covering um, that frequency range, and before we get to the high frequency. So it was the mid-range decoupling that was much more of a challenge that has to handle the step load sort of state change of turning uh, transceiver, transceivers on and off. From a very simplistic point of view, um, you need to look at the VRM. You can look at it in the on and off state to identify the active inductance of what frequency range the VRM can go up to. And then if you actually can get the package die S parameter model from uh, your, of the FPGA or your load of this uh, high, uh, transceiver module, um, if you have that package die model, you can have a pretty good estimate of what capacitance decoupling they have in there uh, in terms of if you look at the S parameter uh, if impedance versus frequency, you'll clearly see where that capacitor, how much capacitance they have in that package. That tells you how much inductance you can have on your printed circuit board and at what frequency range you're gonna ha your capacitors have to go up to. So some of the guidelines that, you know, for a first time designer for power integrity, is just selecting capacitors, the time 10 rule doesn't work. You know, the, the, the 0.1 microfarad, the 1 microfarad, the 10 microfarad. If you actually do a simulation and look at trying to flatten out the impedance, you'll find that, that there's, there's um, some much better choices for the capacitor values. If you design for flat impedance over frequency, it actually works out to be the minimum number of capacitors to achieve the performance that you require. Typically, unless someone's already used the process, of course, um, you can reduce the number of capacitors. If it's, uh, a, you know, if someone's just leveraging a previous design where they've done the factors of 10, you most definitely can reduce the number of capacitors. The thing that's interesting to me with power integrity, in the old days you used to sprinkle these decoupling capacitors around, but back then the currents were much lower, the um, uh, devices were running slower, the transients were slower, and a lot of times you were just trying to really decouple some of the noise. Your, your decoupling capacitors now, you have to realize, are actually sourcing and syncing the power that your load needs. And that's a much uh, uh, more difficult problem uh, to make sure that they're getting the right amount of power when they need it. So, correct, the, the switching uh, the power that you need at, a, at the transient frequencies, at the, the DIDT of the load, uh, we're no longer really seeing a steady state, low frequency uh, power delivery. The, the VRM can no longer really keep up with the actual transients that the loads are doing. And so that's why the designer's job of, of designing that mid-range decoupling is very important. Having the requirements of the power at different frequencies is what every designer really wants. But like most of the engineering world, you can't always get what you want, so you have to uh, work with what you can get. And with um, understanding what the, the current requirements are at different frequencies, one of the things that's interesting with high-speed digital is because the digital pattern can, be ver can vary so much and have a lot of different spectral content, that's why we talk so much about flat impedance, because we need to be flat across a broad range of frequencies, not just one. And then the other thing that's interesting is vendors don't want to give you that very detailed spice model of their product. So uh, again, it's very difficult to get that spectral uh, content of the, the, the load. So in this case, what we did with our paper this year with Xilinx, we looked at the package model and said, They've, uh, uh, the package has a capacitor in there. Above that, they're, they're going to handle all the high frequency above that. So as long as I know what the basic step load is and where their package frequencies will take over, I can estimate a rise time that gives me a good spectral content. And I can start playing with a step load to exercise my uh, printed circuit board mid-range decoupling.
that was one of the, um, I worked with Steve Sandler PicoTest and he, he was, uh, a couple of years ago, he, was, he did a great paper on rogue waves. And if your impedance is not flat, even if you're below the target impedance, if you have some anti-resonances in there, it, at one of those frequencies, um, you're below the target impedance and your ripple no vo voltage will actually meet spec. But if you're unlucky enough to excite that, uh, one of those frequencies along with the two others, now it's like a rogue wave in the ocean. You get one wave going, and then at the peak of the first frequency wave, you start the higher frequency, and at the peak of that one, you start the next higher one, and you can actually get an amplitude that's much higher than just the single um, resonance. And, and then you, even though you're underneath the target impedance, which is the three, the addition of all of them on top of each other uh, can uh, exceed your limit. Right, it's a rogue wave effect. and. Although it's a low probability, I think we all saw the keynote uh, speech this year on automobile uh, safety, and it's when you start talking about very high volumes or high, very high uh, usage of something, then the electronic reliability has to be very, very small. And so then these rogue waves can start to be become a factor. Well, of course, with, with you know, we all see the speeds just continue to increase, the 400 um, gigabit type applications, PAM4, uh, they're even talking, you know, 16 level uh, amplitude modulation. So I think those are challenges that all the instrumentation are keeping up with. Uh, very exciting for Keysight because we have simulation and measurement. Uh, we're launching sort of what we call a pathwave type of concept where we're really trying to integrate the software between instrumentation and measurement and the data transfer and the data analysis to really leverage all of that capability and make it much easier uh, to uh, use that information from all the way from design to manufacturing and uh, product life cycle. You know, PAM4 is an interesting one. Every year we have people that say it, it won't work, it doesn't make sense, and now we have vendors selling PAM4 chips and we have, you know, component vendors selling products that will, you know, connect all these PAM4 devices. So I believe maybe it won't have the fast ramp of some other technologies, but it's definitely here to fill some of the niche uh, applications. So advice for the print circuit board manufacturers and designers is something I think I, I usually say in my interviews is don't forget about the ground return. <laughs> ground is just as important as signal and I, I think that's the worst thing that a lot of our schematics do. You pay attention to all your net, uh, net listing of your signals and ground is something off in the corner. It really is important how the ground return follows. Uh, Power integrity is a great example. You think you're down at DC, it's not AC, it's not RF, not microwave, but the currents are so high the impedance is so low that that ground return inductance and a little bit of resistance there, it can actually start to impact you. And, and ground return again is very significant for power integrity. So my favorite part about DesignCon is just uh, getting a chance to see a lot of my friends that I only get to see once a year here at DesignCon. It's an international conference, so I see people from all around the world. This year was exciting. We did a boot camp, and I believe almost half of the people there were new to DesignCon, so a lot of new faces. And uh, increased attendance and very relevant papers to the fast-changing technology of uh, electronics. If you're a first-time uh, attendee to DesignCon, it, it's challenging. There's a lot of activities going on. Uh, the first day we have tutorials. If you're first time to, to ZionCon, take advantage of the boot camps. Uh, the companies that do those, they're putting a lot of effort into the basic training. They're wonderful courses taught by the very top uh, engineers in the field. Uh, the other thing is during the the week, the, the papers from each of the tracks, you know, select a track and focus on that and get the, the full impact. And then one other thing that's in, uh, that I love also, is also because I'm with Keysight Technologies, but they, we do a special forum. Uh, Keysight does a s special session that we sponsor. It's free to attend, and we also uh, tar you know, look at the latest technologies that are coming out. So there's a lot of opportunities, and of course the evening uh, reception events, and a lot of opportunities to meet the speakers and, and authors of the papers.